Our scripture reading this morning is going to be focused on Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. I had thought I would include both scriptures, but as I kept journeying this week, I stopped feeling Isaiah, and I started resonating more in Mark. So I'm going to focus more on his teachings today as we continue our, uh, as we continue our journey today. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought him all who were sick or possessed with demons, And the whole city was gathered around the door, and they cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And Jesus answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that what is I came out to do. And and he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. Last Sunday we began a three-part teaching series on the Christian faith. Last week our time was spent on what it means to meditate on that which is most simplistic and fundamental for us. That is understanding that faith is an utter trust in God, regardless of the circumstances we are in. This trust is the foundation of a life in faith, but it is not the totality of being in faith. Like the man who builds his house upon sand, when the winds blew hard or the rains came, the sand shifted out from underneath the house and the house fell apart without a proper foundation. You see, a proper foundation is almost always made out of stone or some type of hard material. Everything else will crumble. When our our faith life is not built on something solid, it crumbles. Houses, lives, buildings, without strong commitments to God, they will crumble. A foundation of trust, though, is not enough. For like as the sands blow are blown by the winds, the foundation can be covered over, left unnoticed, unseen, as it's not even being used, and some other structure is needed to help make this faith complete. So today I'd like us to look at an additional part of the Christian faith as we consider a life that's more devoted. As Christians, we place our trust in God, and at the same time we are drawn to Jesus. For it is through Jesus whom God reveals his nature in which we place our trust. But without any form of acquaintance, or relationship with Jesus, we can never come to know, understand, or fully experience God. In other words, you can't sit there and say, I know God, and say that's enough. You have to know him through his son. The Christians who practice genuine faith seek Jesus because Jesus draws upon them. It is a response that tugs at our heart and our mind, and it connects us with our Savior, who then helps us to see the revelation of God in our lives. To a budding Christian, and to the one who's walked with Jesus for several decades, our faith draws us equally to Jesus. Just as the people of Capernaum were drawn to Jesus' Jesus' teaching at the synagogue, as the people were drawn to Jesus by his touch and healing, the power and authority which Jesus teaches with, reaches out for, cares for, heals, guides, protects, and provides us with a power we can find irresistible. It is not something we should question. 
and it is not something we should simply rationalize away. If we allow ourselves to come unto him as a child who is innocent, trusting that no harm will come to us, only good things, this is where we find the power and the presence of Jesus our Savior, irresistible. Tragically, though, many who call themselves Christians are largely unfamiliar with Jesus. They know his name, have said that they accept him as their Lord and Savior. They give him some form of lip service, but they do not take the time or give any priority to know him any more beyond that. Like the gifts he brings. They, they like the gifts he brings, but they do very little to respond in kind to get to know that the gifts he gives us are more powerful, more wonderful, more awesome than we can possibly comprehend. For us to properly respond to Jesus, we must learn about him. And there is no better place to do that than to immerse ourselves into the Gospels themselves. It is amazing at the number of people I have personally come across who say they know Jesus, but have no fundamental grasp on the life and teachings of Jesus. They have brand new, shiny Bibles sitting on their shelves. And if you open it, you hear the spine go, crack. Or and then you look at the cover on the inside and you realize, oh, they've had this since 1962. Their knowledge seems to cover Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection without touching on anything in between. And there's a lot there. The knowledge there is made up of a few stray, their knowledge is made up of a few stray sayings or stories and a phrase or two of a familiar hymn mixed in with their own subjective wishes and impressions of what Jesus ought to be like in their eyes. This then leaves us as uninformed believers. With a Jesus who never confronts our cherished ideas, who never challenges us in our cushy, comfortable beliefs. When you read the Gospels, you read where Jesus is challenging where people are at the moment in their lives, asking the fundamental question, where does God rate in all of this? Where do you rely on him? You say you know him, you say you're a descendant, you say you're a follower, let me see you live it. The only real antidote for this imaginary Jesus that folks that don't know him is a healthy shot of the real thing. And the only place where we can get a healthy shot of the real Jesus is in the presentation that we find within the scriptures. Matthew, the most Jewish written gospel of them all. Mark, the shortest, most condensed, smallest of the three, but the first one written. Luke, the one that has the greatest amount of compassion and detail when it comes to healing and equality for all people of all races and genders. John, the philosopher, the thinker, the one who you make, makes you ponder. It's almost like reading a legal document. His prose is so complete in the Greek. I have watched specials on TV, listened to interviews, lectures, read textbooks and devotional books about spirituality. But what I'm being given is someone's digested interpretation of what they believe who Jesus is. But none of them bring me to a place where I have to encounter and experience him like I do when I read the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is no substitute for regularly exploring the life of Jesus as presented by these four gospel writers. Even y'all listening to me right now, sharing in this, te this lesson that I'm giving you, it gives you what I have studied, what I have found, what God has led me to share with all of you. But if we don't take time to regularly read, study, and learn who Jesus is, none of us will know him. And if we really don't know him, then how can we hear him? How can we trust him? How can we follow him? 
How can we be transformed by him to become the creation God has called and created us to be? More importantly, how can we genuinely share him with others? Now I know we all have busy lives. I do too. And sometimes the Bible can be difficult to understand. But the reality is that there are many accessible translations of the scriptures out there. And a lot of them are very readable. And let's be honest. When we believe something is important, we always find a way to make time for it. I encourage you to get to know Jesus directly through the eyes of the gospel writers. They were there. This reading as this reading that we had is as close to knowing Jesus as you can get. Nothing else that the world can throw at you can come close. But reading about Jesus isn't enough either. Joseph Stalin read the Bible every day. A lot of people don't know that. But he didn't read it as a book to grow in faith. He read it as a book of history, to understand a culture. I think the way to practice Christian faith also includes prayer, which is why we put these out there, these blue notes, which is why we make a prayer list for you to take with you and remember your friends. It's why we put it in our weekly email so we can constantly be praying for not only ourselves but for each other. And I'm not talking about prayer that is just whining about how things aren't going my way. I'm talking about some prayer of being in a relationship with Jesus. To offer prayers as wish lists of all things and all changes that can take place and all the blessing for which we long for. But if that is the only way we pray, then what we're doing is reducing God to some type of celestial Santa Claus who only responds to our, prop, our prompting and our wish list. I think healthy prayer, rooted in the Christian faith, is first and foremost about building a relationship. It starts with a private interaction with God, but is meant to grow beyond ourselves, taking our private interaction and allowing it to overwhelm us and so we can share it with others as we gather in a place like this to worship and meditate and support one another. I believe prayer is a time when we can share with God the hopes and hurts of our hearts and when we experience God's intimate presence in our lives, we can celebrate and give thanks both individually and together. And like all relationships, all good, healthy relationships, it requires time and it requires honesty. Can any of us sustain a healthy relationship with our parents, our siblings, our spouses, our children, our friends, our coworkers, without giving them some serious time and honesty? It is the same way with a relationship with our God. Just believing that he's there and he knows us and he knows what we want so he'll give it to us, that is not engaging. That is passively hoping that God's droppings will bless you. In our time of study and prayer, we should plan to work in sustaining a relationship, an honest relationship, that prompts some form of intimacy. An intimacy that can grow over time so that we can understand the beauty and wonder of our God more. Or just simply be more joyous and content that he loves and he's there for us. This means that we share with God not only our hopes and our concerns, but also our fears and failures. We let God know of those ways in which we may feel we have let God down and the way we feel God has let us down. We celebrate the gifts of life and creation. 
And in these and other ways, prayer becomes a relationship with God that nothing in life can take away from us. It is from that relationship we are able to feel God's protection, God's strength, because of our trust, which is a foundational element of our faith. Lastly, I think Christian faith cultivates community in being drawn to Jesus. We are coming to him, we want to pray, but it also draws us together as a body. Association with others who share in faith helps us to hold steady to our own faith. The communal aspect of Christian faith has many forms. Worship is a central part of that. We sing the songs, we pray, we hear the scriptures, and give resources to the community. But when we do so out of faith, all of those things not only give us a sense of protection, but a sense of restoration as well. In addition to worship, Christian community forms groups like choirs and small groups and Sunday schools where fellowship and meals and work are all shared together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And every time we interact with another person who generally lives the faith, our own formation will grow. There is no solidarity Christianity. You can't just join up because you believe in what's going on. Jesus himself began his ministry by calling others to join him. His ministry attracted a few intimate disciples, hundreds of followers, and even more interested listeners. The impact of Jesus' presence is a story that takes individuals and brings them together into community. Our faith goes nowhere and does little unless it is combined with the faith of others. The scriptures, prayer, and community are vital components of the Christian faith. They spring from our trust in God and they develop that trust into a deeper and more profound experience. These Three elements are indispensable, indisputable components of the Christian faith. But faith is not only about us, and it's not only about building up our trust in God. It also has an an essential external dimension that connects us not only with our Savior and one another, but those outside these walls as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about next week. For now, though, dust off your Bible. If you don't understand the translation, go find another one. Spend some time to get one that it grabs you and teaches you. If you don't know, if you don't understand what you're looking at, we have a library that has dictionaries and commentaries that can help you understand. But don't be afraid to ask the questions to God, to the Spirit, to open your mind to understanding, to grow closer to Him. Because if all you do is trust in God, and you just say you love Jesus, but you don't do anything with it, and I'm not talking about works, I'm talking about growing the relationship, it'll be very easy to feel hollow and abandoned and unfulfilled in your faith. And that's not what God wants us to be. He wants us to not only feel that joy all the time, but to have that joy grow over a lifetime. Whether that lifetime is 30 days, 30 years, 80 years, no matter where you are, you can always grow deeper in your understanding, in your relationship, so you can live that trust wherever you go. And the people of God gathered said, Amen.